The Divine Sage by J.P. Cunningham Narrated by David Sweeney Bear Chapter 2 HMS Conway, Valparaiso, Chile, 19th December, 1820 A loud cheer rang out across the deck as we rounded the headland and the whitewashed houses and church spires of Valparaiso slipped into view. The Chilean port had gained quite a reputation for its well-stocked taverns and lively dance halls, and after four months at sea there was considerable excitement on board the Conway. Standing on the quarter-deck, I drew the eye of my telescope along the crescent bay. A crowd was gathering on the beach to welcome us, men and women dressed in colourful ponchos, and children running about excitedly on the sand. I focused a lens on the bell-tower of an official-looking building in the centre of the port. It was in all likelihood the town hall, and, no doubt, where I would be spending much of my time over the coming months, engrossed in matters of trade. A curious notion then struck me. I felt as though I recognised the place, not just the town hall, but the entire port, the way it was hemmed in by steep cliffs, the houses crowded into a narrow strip along the bay and forming straggling lines up the ravines. Even the old fort seemed familiar, situated as it was on a rocky outcrop at the southern end of the bay. Cannon fire cracked through the air to mark our arrival, and the Conway fired her cannons in a return salute. I followed the tendrils of smoke as they rose up from the battlements of the fort, moving the glass eye along the line of the cliffs, and then surveying the uncultivated hills beyond. I came across an isolated house, perhaps a farmhouse. Morning sunlight glinted back from the upper windows. I could make out a winding track curling around the hillside towards the house, and a garden scattered with trees. There it was again, that odd sense of familiarity. Just then a strong gust of wind blew across the deck, sending the sails flapping against their masts. It felt gritty against my cheek. Where the devil did that come from? Lieutenant Darby said from beside me on the quarter-deck. A squall from the mainland, I suggested, rubbing my eyes. A dusty one at that. Walking across to the barometer, I checked the needle. It was steady, no sign of bad weather. Turning my gaze in the direction of the port, I noticed the inhabitants were making a quick retreat from the beach. The hills in the distance were disappearing from view, concealed by a rust-coloured haze. The wind suddenly veered and strengthened. All hands on deck! I cried out. Without warning, the ocean beneath us rose up into a swell, and the Conway began rolling and pitching on her hull. The crew braced themselves, holding onto the railings and ropes with their eyes turned towards the quarter-deck in eager anticipation. Send orders to shorten sail, I ordered Darby, and free the headsheets. Darby turned on his heel and hurried down to the main deck, echoing my commands, his black hair whipping about his face. Before the crew had time to seize the clue lines and hoist the topsails, the ship sliced through a breaking wave with a heavy jolt. Water surged over the bulwarks, sweeping Darby into a line of men who were heaving on a chain, all of whom then lost their footing and landed in a tangled heap. Above me, a man was left clinging like a cat in one of the yard arms. Another dangled from the rigging, kicking his feet in an attempt to regain his foothold. The Conway lurched helplessly to windward, then crashed over another wave, drenching us all. As she rose out of the swell, the bowsprit swung towards the southern cliffs, where white surf churned over the exposed rocks. Put down the helm! I yelled from the railing. The men slipped and slid about the deck, bellowing out to one another to hold tight as they fought to regain control of the ship. Enshrouded now in a cloud of orange dust, the Conway began shuddering violently from stem to stern. Slowly but surely she began to turn, the bowsprit sweeping in a counterclockwise direction until it pointed once more towards the shore. Come hang, come hold together. Hooray, hooray. Come hang for finer weather. Hang, boys, hang. 
The crew were in their element, bawling out sea shanties as they steadied the sails and we cut determinedly towards the bay. As if realising it was defeated, the dusty squall died away as quickly as it had come. Within minutes the sea was calm again, the sky returning to its former dazzling blue. Indeed, were it not for the little mounds of dirt in the corners of the deck, I might easily have been convinced that I had imagined the entire thing. We dropped anchor a couple of hundred yards from the beach and began making the necessary preparations to take the boats ashore. While speaking with the boatswain, I saw Mr. Gillies appear on deck, walking unsteadily with a cane. Gillies was not a tall man, and his height was further diminished by his stooped posture. He was dressed in a tired-looking brown jacket, but wore a colourful green neckcloth with gold spots. Tucked beneath his arm, he carried a sketchbook. I called out his name, beckoning him to the quarter-deck. "'She is a lively port, by all accounts,' I said, helping Gillies up the stairs. I had not laid eyes on the man since the night we found him on the bow, half frozen to death. In the daylight he was a funny-looking fellow. His face was small and round, and his hair was a mass of tightly knotted curls. His skin, tinged yellow by his illness, looked delicately thin and was peppered with freckles beneath his eyes. "'I doubt I will be here for long,' he said, squinting through his spectacles in the direction of the beach. I presumed that Gillies was lamenting his failing health until he added, quite to my surprise, "'I am heading northwards to Mexico.' "'Mexico?' He fixed me with his sharp grey-green eyes. "'As is the Conway, I hear.' "'Perhaps,' I said, "'but I cannot say when.' Seeing the puzzled frown on his face, I then went on to explain. "'I receive orders only days before our departure. The Admiralty refrain from disclosing the destination earlier in order to protect British interests. It could be several months, or more than a year.' "'I know how it works.' Gillies said, dismissing my words with a flick of his hand. He pointed to a patch of shade near the bulwarks. Might I sit down over there? I find all this sunlight rather intense. Mexico is several months' voyage by sea, I went on, watching him lower himself slowly down onto the deck. Once you cross the equator, the heat will become oppressive, and you will not find refuge in the comfort of your cabin either. You will be driven up onto the baking deck with the rest of the men. Then I suppose I will have to bake, he said with a sigh. Fumbling in his pocket, he withdrew a pencil. I am just saying that if I were you, I would stay right here. Given your illness, a voyage. I appreciate your concern, Captain, he interjected, opening his sketchbook with a lukewarm smile in my direction but I am afraid I am not very good at listening to advice. I was still staring at the man in resignation when Woolerton approached the quarter-deck. He threw Gillies a disparaging look. I very much doubted the lieutenant was as pleased as I was to see he was still alive. We were hoping you might give permission for a swimming race to the shore, he said, tipping his hat. The conditions couldn't be better, and they all fancy a bit of a flutter. I glanced down at the main deck to see a hundred grubby faces looking expectantly back at me. Why not, I thought. The men have worked hard. They deserve a little fun. I walked over to the railing and called out. Ten shillings goes to the first man on the beach. Coins and tobacco exchanged hands as the competitors stripped down to their slops and began jumping and stretching on the wooden boards. Contrary to what one might think, sailors are often poor swimmers. But on any ship there are a few who excel in the water and relish the opportunity to show off their talent. "'If I might offer you a tip, Captain,' Woolerton muttered through his beard, "'place a wager on Slake, unbeaten in three such races on the Alceste.' He nodded in the direction of the man in question, a sinewy deckhand elbowing his way through the rabble. "'I have two shillings saying you'll take this lot.' Slick was listed in the ship's muster book as a Mr. Jacob Allen. He was a dirty-nailed, mean sort, and I often wondered whether his nickname had arisen from the greasiness of his hair or the general oiliness of his character. Leaning back against the gunwale, he punched the air with his fist as if he had already won the race. Gillies glanced up from his sketchbook. Two shillings? 
Is that all? Woolerton shot him a look. What's it to you? I just thought it rather a measly sum, Gillies replied with a casual shrug. Given your assuredness that Slick is our champion. And what great sum are you willing to wager? The lieutenant said, his lip curling into a smirk. Gillies reached into his pocket and brought out a small purse. He tossed it up and down in his hand, making as if to calculate its weight. I should say there is at least fifteen shillings in here. Save your money for a tailor, Woolerton said. Fix the holes in that moth-eaten jacket of yours. If I win, I shall buy myself a new jacket. Gillies began proudly plucking at his cuffs. And trousers to match. I will wager fifteen shillings, sir, if you are game. Woolerton lifted his hands, implying he had tried his best to convince the man otherwise. If you insist on being a fool, sir, then who am I to stop you? Choose your man. Gillies got to his feet. Walking to the railing, he looked down at the competitors. Having already climbed over the gunwale, they were now shuffling in a line along the channel board, clinging to the shrouds and cat lines for support. Must I select one of these ruffians? Unless you wish to swim yourself, Woolerton mocked. Gillies turned and looked at me. What I meant was, may I choose any man if he agrees to swim? Choose whomsoever you like, I said in exasperation, so long as you are quick about it. He stood for a while, pursing his lips, then pointed in the direction of the mainmast. Aha! There he is, our champion. I followed the line of his finger. Mr. Legg. He nodded. A sure winner, skinny legs and big feet. The young lieutenant was leaning against the mast with his arms folded and his face turned towards the sun. Officers do not usually take part in such races, I said. I am sure you were quite aware of that. I thought you said I could pick anyone I liked, he replied, and I like Mr. Legg. There were no rules to these swimming races, and in the past I had seen many a dirty tactic secure an unworthy winner, which is why I was not at all happy with the idea of one of my lieutenants taking part. But then Charles Legg was a smart lad, one who would not risk compromising his standing amongst the crew. It occurred to me then that Gillies might have chosen Legg as a way of getting out of the wager, and I decided to play along in the hope that I could stop the silly thing from going ahead. Very well, you may ask Mr. Legg, I said, but if he declines your request, the wager is off. And if he accepts, Gillies said, then let it be on his head, and yours too. Picking up his cane, he made his way gingerly to the stairs and climbed down to the main deck. I watched him weave through the men to the lieutenant. I said he were trouble, Woolerton remarked. He'll be up to no good, mark my words. Down on deck, the two men talked. Leg began rubbing the back of his neck and shaking his head. When he looked my way, I held up my hands to indicate that I had no part in this foolishness. Gillies, however, appeared to be quite persistent, and continued talking and gesticulating for a few minutes longer. He had better watch out, Woolerton said. We all know what happened to the last lieutenant Mr. Gillies took a liking to. He were dead before... Might I suggest you take Mr. Burney's word on that matter? I said, interrupting Woolerton before he annoyed me further. And might I also suggest that you stop listening to idle gossip? There is nothing so low as willfully damaging another man's reputation for the sole reason of having something to say. The conversation between Gillies and Legg came to a close, leaving the young lieutenant scratching his brow. I was about to turn away, satisfied that the matter was done with, when I noticed that Gillies was now whispering in the ear of Mr. Lang, the purser, as he collected the bets from the men. Lang beckoned to Leg with his hand. "'What on earth are they up to?' I said under my breath, as the two men disappeared down the companionway steps. Surely Leg was not about to take part in the race. But alas, the lieutenant reappeared a few minutes later, bare-chested and wearing only a pair of cotton slops. He walked self-consciously through the cheering, stamping crowd, with his arms tightly folded. 
Clambering over the gunwale, he joined the nine other contestants on the channel board. I had hoped Legg would be less impressionable. Having placed himself in a position where he no longer had seniority over the men, the lieutenant was in danger of compromising his authority in the future if he did not handle himself correctly. Even now he looked vulnerable, his milk-white skin conspicuous in a line of tanned and brawny men. I took a deep breath, maintaining my composure. I supposed that, if nothing else, this would serve as a lesson for the lad. The rest of the contestants flapped their arms and shook their legs in readiness for the race, goading and nudging each other boisterously. With one hand clinging to the shrouds, Leg leant forwards and peered down at the water beneath him. Gillies returned to the quarter-deck with a grin on his face. Was it entirely necessary to coerce him into this foolishness? I said as he settled back down in his spot in the shade. I prefer the term gentle persuasion, Gillies replied, picking up his sketchbook again. And what form might this gentle persuasion have taken? He shrugged his thin shoulders as if to make light of my question. I merely informed him that his captain wished to see him win. I said nothing of the sort, I snapped, glaring at him. And neither did I tell the young man that you said such a thing, Gillies replied coolly. Simply that you wished to see. Am I not correct? For the second time that day I found myself staring wide-eyed at Gillies. Before I had time to say anything more, however, we were interrupted by the arrival of one of the midshipmen, Mr. Garvey, carrying the ship's horn. Let's get this over and done with, I said with a sigh. Taking the instrument, I turned back to the railing and shouted, Swimmers, ready yourselves! The crew fell silent. The contestants stood poised with bent knees, gripping the edge of the channel board with their toes. I blew a long, brassy note. The men leapt from the ship into the cobalt-blue water below. Reappearing a moment later, they began splashing frantically towards the shore. I have been reading your book, Gillies said, continuing with his sketching. He seemed quite disinterested in the race. Voyage to Lu Chu. A fascinating story. It is a factual account, not a story, I corrected him. Taken from the entries in my journal while on board the Lyra. And there were no embellishments for the sake of storytelling, I can assure you. A strict adherence to facts had been instilled in me at an early age. My father, Sir James Hall, had been an eminent geologist in his day, president of the Royal Society of Scotland, an exclusive club for the country's scientific elite. Indeed, I shall never forget the day of my very first voyage when my father accompanied me to the docks. I was only fourteen years old and would be away at sea for an entire year. While the other parents hugged and kissed their boys, my father stood awkwardly on the quay, holding a package, which he thrust into my hands as I was called aboard. A journal for you to write in, he had said stiffly. It is not a gift, it is a responsibility. Observe without bias and write accurately without embellishments. Your duty is not to please, it is to educate, so no silly flourishes. I have never forgotten those words, nor the sentiment that followed. He clasped my hand in a formal handshake, as if we were two men having completed a business arrangement. Then, uttering the briefest of farewells, he turned and walked away. With the glass to my eye, I followed the swimmers as they splashed towards the turquoise shallows. I was pleasantly surprised to see Leg out in front, though Slick was close on his tail. "'You should watch this,' I said to Gillies. "'Your man is winning.' "'Is that so?' he replied, frowning as he scrutinized whatever it was he was sketching. Mr. Legg has quite the physique of a swimmer, would you not agree, Mr. Woolerton? Such well-defined Latissimus Dorsey. Woolerton was standing next to the bulwarks with his telescope trained on the swimmers. I am not one to spend my time looking at a man's Lassimus Dorsey, he said, nor any other part of his body. There was shouting on the deck below. Several men were squabbling for possession of the few telescopes they shared amongst themselves. The rest crowded the railing, shielding their eyes from the sun as they stared in the direction of the beach. I think we just lost ourselves a lieutenant, 
Woolerton scoffed, turning to Gillies with a smirk on his face. Through my own glass I could see neither leg nor slick. What in God's name? A man broke the surface. It was slick. To my relief, the young lieutenant appeared shortly afterwards, though he seemed to be flailing. Slick began whipping something about his head. Legs cotton slops. Tossing them well out of reach, he swam towards the shore. Your cleverness has cost you a pretty sum today, Mr. Gillies, Woolerton said. He strode across the deck and snatched Gillies's purse, tipping the contents into his hand. I count only twelve shillings here. Means you still owe me three. Gillies seemed unbothered, slipping his pencil into his jacket pocket and stretching his arms in the air. Is it over? he said with a yawn. Have we a winner? Down below the crew began stamping on the boards and shouting Legs' name. Refocusing the lens, I was astonished to see the lieutenant running through the breakers and up onto the sandy beach, all blonde hair and white buttocks in the morning sunshine. Slick hauled himself through the knee-deep water some distance behind. A boy ran up to Leg and handed him a poncho, which he slipped over his head. Turning towards us, he raised his arms into the air victoriously. A raucous cheer resounded across the deck. It looks as though your man has been well and truly beaten, I said to Woolerton, concealing my jubilation as best I could. Give Mr. Gillies his purse back, and whatever you owe him. Twelve shillings, or did you settle on fifteen? Woolerton took off his hat and wiped his brow with his sleeve, his thinning iron-grey hair matted against his sweaty scalp. Scratching his beard, he began grumbling that he did not have sufficient money on his person and would settle the wager later. In the spirit of good sportsmanship, the debt must be settled immediately, I ordered, knowing full well that it would not be paid once we were ashore. You will see to this right away, Mr. Woolerton. While we waited for Woolerton to return, Gillies showed me what he'd been sketching, a half-finished portrait of a young man, whom I could already tell was Leg. Blessed with his great-grandfather's good looks, Gillies said, but without a trace of the proud duke's legendary vanity. I see. I looked Gillies in the eye. So you are aware of Mr. Legg's heritage? He nodded. I trust you will keep this to yourself, I said. I do not want the men thinking the lieutenant gained his position on my ship through family connections, because that was certainly not the case. My own experience had taught me how difficult life could be for a young officer if the crew were led to believe he had attained his rank through privilege rather than ability. In Legg's case the situation was especially sensitive, as he was the great-grandson of Charles Seymour, the sixth Duke of Somerset, a man nicknamed the Proud Duke after boasting of how his exceptionally good looks had won him favour within the royal household. "'Your secret is safe with me!' Gillies said, touching his finger to his lips. Charles Legg is a rare breed, far more than just good looks and heritage. He climbed to his feet. You will need to look after him. I am sure Mr. Legg can look after himself. Gillies shrugged his shoulders. I am not so certain. He is a pure soul, a rose growing amongst a tangle of weeds. Then was it entirely necessary to coerce him into that swimming race? I said. And I have not forgotten how you placed Mr. Legg in a difficult spot on the night of the Aurora. Given you know about his heritage, I am inclined to wonder. It will not do to be suspicious of my intentions, Gillies said, cutting me off. We must trust each other, you and I. There is a lot at stake. I found it a rather odd thing to say, but before I had the opportunity to ask him what he meant, Woolerton reappeared from below deck. Returning to the quarter-deck, he delved into his pocket and withdrew a handful of coins. Let us hope you live long enough to spend this, he said, thrusting the coins into Gillies's hand and avoiding his eye. I shall buy that new jacket, Gillies said, grinning at me. And when I die... I hope the captain will bury me in it. You think yourself so clever, Woolerton spat back at him. All them clever words, 
We'll see our father get you once we're ashore and there's nobody to watch your back. Is that a threat? Gillies asked. Now, now, there is no need for this, I said. Mr. Gillies won the wager fair and square. Shake hands like good sports and let's get on with more important matters. Woolton's hands remained firmly by his side, his fists clenched. Excuse me, Captain, if I return to my duties. You must shake first. That is an order, Lieutenant. He did so, albeit begrudgingly, then left the quarter-deck in a sulk. I returned to my cabin. There would be countless meetings with town officials and dignitaries once I stepped ashore, and I needed to ensure my affairs were in order. The trouble-free passage had given me ample time to prepare the paperwork, which sat in a neat pile on my bureau. Yet, as I flicked mindlessly from page to page, I felt anxious, as if I had overlooked something of importance. Something was missing or out of place. I paced across the floorboards, trying to rid myself of the unnerving feeling that prickled my neck and caused butterflies in my stomach. My mother used to call this the sixth sense, an awareness of something that lay unseen in the future. My father would have argued it was nature's instinct, and that my mind was simply misinterpreting what was little more than common anxiety. I poured myself a whisky, knocking it back in a single hit. First voyage as captain, I said to the bottom of the glass, bound to come with a little apprehension here and there. Walking to the gilded mirror on my wall, I studied my reflection. I had my father's strong, straight nose and my mother's deep brown eyes. My hair was thick and black and rose into a widow's peak high upon my brow. The beard I had begun growing lay as a dark shadow on my chin. Examining my countenance in this way was a habit that I often performed before official engagements. The purpose was not for vanity, but rather a sense of detachment, and I continued this inspection until I felt the familiar sense of separation between my inner and outer self. The man returning my gaze was a captain and a commander. He had gone to sea as a boy, and laboured, as all the young boys had, without complaint. As a midshipman he had taken the midnight watch, whilst the other midshipmen slept in their cots, and as a lieutenant he had used every ounce of his influence and intelligence to gain favour with the admiralty, so that they might consider him for a captain's post. The man in the mirror had climbed the ladder of ambition without ever looking down, and though he knew my darkest secrets, they did not haunt him as they haunted me. I watched my ally straighten his collars and adjust his cravat, his steady eyes never leaving mine. He dabbed a little cologne onto his neck and inhaled its jasmine and musk scent, then plucked a stray thread from one of his epaulettes. I trusted this man with my life. Turning on my heel, I left my cabin and returned on deck. Chapter 3 Valparaiso, Chile, 28th December, 1820 We anchored in Valparaiso when the Yuletide celebrations were at their height and multitudes of people had arrived from the countryside to enjoy the festivities. The main attraction of the season was the bullfights, which were quite unlike the bloodthirsty performances I had witnessed in Spain. The bullfights began with a crowd gathering at noon in one of the plazas, and the lumbering beasts would then be paraded along the main street to a makeshift bullring by the harbour. It was a noisy procession, accompanied by the sounding of horns and ringing of bells, which grew in size and fervour as the crowd passed the taverns and swept up the drunken townsfolk and sailors alike. The bullfights themselves were an amusing, if frivolous, affair, the bulls were never injured in the performance, merely chastised with blunt spears until they stamped and snorted and inevitably charged at their gaily dressed provokers, who ran around waving at the audience before leaping out of the ring to safety, all to roars of laughter and thunderous applause. When the daytime festivities were over, the women and children retired, and the revelry took on a more primitive and boisterous nature. 
By nightfall, the men were dancing under flaming torches on the beach, throwing themselves at one another in drunken embraces and bawling out unfamiliar ballads in hoarse and discordant voices. I had taken lodgings in a suburb called the Almendral, or Almond Grove, situated on an elevated plain on the eastern side of the town. The narrow cobbled streets and whitewashed townhouses of the Almendral were built by wealthy colonials who wished to recreate the flavour and charm of a Spanish pueblo on Chilean soil. It was here that the officers from visiting ships preferred to stay. The days following our arrival in the port saw me engrossed in diplomatic business, but even this was suspended over Yule, giving me time to relax and attend a few social functions. Christmas came and went with its usual overindulgence of eating and drinking, and having survived a grandiose banquet on St. Stephen's, I decided to hide away in my lodgings and venture no further than the tranquil plazas of the Almendral until the new year was in. On a sunny afternoon at the end of December, Mr. Legg paid me an unexpected visit. The young lieutenant arrived on my doorstep shortly after midday, dressed in a linen shirt and wearing a silly straw hat adorned with white feathers. "'Many happy returns, Captain,' he announced as I opened the door, greeting me with a beaming smile. Taking his hands from behind his back, he revealed a second hat, this one with a yellow ribbon around its brim and yellow feathers to match. "'A birthday gift for you, sir.' "'Thank you.' It is quite splendid, I said delicately, taking the hat from him. It was my thirty-second birthday that day, and to be quite honest, I had given the occasion little more than a passing thought. I was rather hoping you might like to join me for the last bullfight of the season, Legg said. I glanced past him into the plaza. There were only one or two people about, but the tranquillity was disturbed by a cacophony of bells and horns, and the sound of people cheering from somewhere not too far away. I am afraid I must decline. I have work to do. Could you not spare an hour or two? Legg asked, his face already taking on traces of disappointment. The whole town has turned out in the marketplace. There is all sorts going on. I liked Legg. Indeed, I had liked him on the very first day we met, when he had sat nervously in my office with flushed cheeks and sweat dripping from his brow. He had arrived twenty minutes late for his interview, having been sent to the wrong ship by a senior officer in what I had suspected to be a cruel joke. Despite my initial reservations at this poor start, Legg proceeded to win me over during his interview. His previous post was as midshipman on a Mediterranean voyage, and the reference I had received from his captain was filled with praise for the lad's good nature, honesty, and intelligence. Having settled into the interview, Legg demonstrated a commendable knowledge of sailing. Indeed, my only minor concern had been that he looked too young to be a lieutenant, which I told him, adding in jest that I would only give him the position if he managed to grow some facial hair before we set sail. And here he stood, with his hair plaited into a ponytail and a downy red beard on his chin, trying to hide his disappointment at my having turned down his kind invitation. Yes, I liked Legg, and I suppose I also wanted him to like me. I was ten years older than he was, and his captain, but it did not seem so long ago that I was a lieutenant. Back then my commanders had been aloof and distant men. Aspiring to be as they were, I used to imitate them, secretly practising the way they walked, the slow and sagacious way they nodded their heads when listening to their officers, the way they interrupted a conversation to issue an order, leaving the man who was talking with the words hanging in his mouth. In those formative years I had moulded myself to become what I believed a captain should be, and the clay had hardened. But with leg the clay was still pliable and wet. And that morning, as he stood there on my step, I wanted him to see that his captain was not always such a detached and impersonal fellow, but that it was a necessary role I had to play as my duty to our country and for the safety of the ship. I placed the straw hat on my head. I suppose an old man should have a little fun on his birthday, I said, reaching out and taking him by the shoulder. Come along, then. Let us see what mischief we can get ourselves into. 
We walked into the town and soon became caught up in the clamouring procession that filled the cobbled street leading downhill to the marketplace. Leg and I had not spoken on a personal level before now, and I listened with interest as he talked with great affection about his family, in particular his mother, to whom he wrote frequently. I was, however, somewhat distracted by the reactions of the townsfolk as they caught sight of the lieutenant. Fair-haired sailors were not uncommon in the port, and certainly drew the attention of the Chileans, but with Leg it went beyond simply stopping and staring. On several occasions I witnessed people, men and women alike, pushing purposely through the crowds so that they could shuffle alongside us. I watched how they stepped in front of Leg quite unashamedly, tripping over their feet as they spun around to take in his piercing blue eyes, which carried in their depths an unusual translucence. And, as if simply looking were not enough to satisfy their curiosity, I noticed their surreptitious attempts to touch him, reaching out to place a hand on his shoulder or his back as they jostled forwards, or sliding up next to him so that they might brush their fingers against the white flesh on his exposed forearm. Leg seemed oblivious to this attention. Perhaps after several weeks in the port he had become used to it. The marketplace was crowded with merrymakers, the festivities spilling out into the surrounding streets and along the promenade. We stopped to watch two wild-looking horsemen prance about on all quarters, wielding swords above their heads. In the middle of this frantic display, a young girl ran out into the street, and were it not for Leg's swift response, she might have been trampled. ¿Dónde está tu madre? Leg said, crouching down and brushing the hair away from her eyes. She was perhaps six or seven years of age, and dressed in the tattered clothes of a beggar. En el cielo, she cried, pointing her tiny finger to the sky. Leg looked up at me, then asked the child. ¿Y tu padre? Papa se está muriendo. Ayúdame, por favor, she said desperately. Leg was unwilling to leave the child in such a distressed state, and inquired as to where her sick father was. She slid her hand into his, tugging on it so that she might lead the way. We followed her through the streets and into the ravines below the cliffs, a suburb known as the Quebradas. It was here the poorest members of the community lived, the brickmakers, day labourers and washerwomen. The ramshackle houses of the Quebradas were small, single-storey buildings, built with crumbling stones and thatched with broad palm leaves. There was no trace of the affluence of the Almendral here, but having taken several walks in the area, I found the people richer in conversation and humour than their wealthy neighbours, and in generosity too, despite their meagre earnings. We continued threading our way through one street after another until, rounding a corner into a dirty alleyway, the girl ran ahead and disappeared through an open doorway. We soon found ourselves in a miserable dwelling that comprised a single, comfortless room with a mud floor and a broken ceiling. I covered my mouth and nose with my hand. The air was fouled by the smell of feces. In the dim light thrown from a single tallow candle, I could make out a work table cluttered with carpentry tools and a makeshift stove with smouldering embers. Upon a narrow bed in the corner of the room, a half-naked man was laid out like a corpse, his coarse black hair hanging over the side. He was groaning heavily. Estoy asustada, the girl said, tears streaming down her cheeks. Leg crouched beside her, placing his hands on her shoulders. There is nothing to be afraid of. Reaching into his pocket, he took out a clean white handkerchief embroidered in one corner with his initials. He used it to dab the tears from the child's face. We are here to help. The girl flung her arms around the lieutenant's neck and began sobbing as if her little heart would burst. Upon hearing his daughter's voice, the man's eyes opened. His head turned towards her. Louisa! Louisa! He mumbled, reaching out. Se valiente, mi niña, se valiente. The man was a ghastly sight, soaked in his own vomit. His bulging eyes stared wildly in my direction. We must fetch Mr. Burney, Leg said, gently freeing himself from the child's embrace. Burney is still on board the Conway, I told him. He plans to sort out old Radcliffe's foot this morning. Perhaps a local doctor from the hospital? 
The man heaved, and I watched aghast as a river of spittle ran from the corners of his mouth. We may already be too late. What about Mr. Gillies? Legg suggested. I had not spoken to Gillies since our arrival in the port, but thought I might know where he was staying. On several occasions I had spied him hobbling across the Almendral Plaza before disappearing down an alleyway into a house with a blue door. Stay with the child, I said. It's worth a shot. I hurried back through the streets, pushing my way through the crowded marketplace, then climbing the hill to the Almendral with the sun beating on my brow and sweat trickling down my neck. Arriving at the plaza, I made my way down the alleyway to the tired-looking blue door. I banged on it with my fist until, after quite some time, a surly-looking woman in a black dress answered. "'I must speak with Mr. Gillies,' I said, removing my straw hat and wiping my brow with my shirt sleeve. "'It is a matter of some urgency.' The door was summarily closed in my face, and I was left waiting impatiently on the step for several minutes. Just as I was about to recommence my knocking, the door opened again. This time I was greeted by the familiar whiskered face and sharp grey-green eyes of John Gillies. "'Captain Hall, how nice to see you,' he said, then frowning as he looked me up and down. "'But I can see this is not a social visit.' "'A man in the Quebradas is in a ghastly state,' I said. Mr. Legg and I found him bedridden with a high fever and swollen eyes. We hoped you might take a look at him. Gillies stuck his head out of the doorway and glanced down the alleyway. I am afraid I cannot help. It is rather a long way, and I am feeling a little out of sorts today. It was Mr. Legg's suggestion that I fetch you, I said, tossing my hat down on the step. There is a young child, the man's daughter, Leg is quite taken with her, and by the looks of it she will be left all alone if her father dies. Yes, well, that is a pity, Gillies said, but I doubt there is much I can do. I should say you owe Mr. Leg a favour, I said. You might not have been able to afford these lodgings were it not for his swimming prowess. Gillies contemplated this for a moment, then sighed and nodded his head. All right, wait here while I retrieve my bag. It took well over an hour for us to make our way back to the Quebradas. The streets were becoming steadily busier, and as I pushed a path through the crowds, Gillies hobbled along behind me with his cane, stopping every few hundred yards to catch his breath or cough hoarsely into a handkerchief. We entered the dwelling to find the room silent. Our patient looked as though he had fallen unconscious, and the little girl sat huddled in a corner with her arms around her knees. Legg sat on the floor next to her and scrambled to his feet as we entered. Gilly spent some time examining the ailing man, prizing his eyelids open and inspecting his eyeballs, looking into his mouth, feeling his brow, pressing down on his ribs, then lifting his arm and feeling for his pulse. The man remained motionless. Is he dead? Legg asked quietly. Not yet. Gillies placed his satchel on the floor, then rolled up his sleeves. I believe he has the Chao Longo, a local fever that can be fatal if left unchecked. We will need to make a tourniquet. He pointed to the work table. That strip of leather will do. Boil some water on the stove. Gillies bound the man's arm above the elbow. Opening his satchel, he removed a thin knife and a piece of cloth. Cover her eyes he said, nodding at the girl. Leg took the child into the corner of the room. Meanwhile, Gillies made a clean incision in the man's forearm. I watched the blood run in a thick rivulet down his arm and went to fetch a pot to place underneath his bleeding limb. That should help relieve the pressure, Gillies said, wiping his brow and leaving a smear of blood on his forehead. Now we wait. In the minutes that followed, we stood in silence, listening to the blood dripping from the man's fingers into the pot. I watched in astonishment as the veins on his forehead withdrew. The swelling beneath his eyes subsided, and his breathing calmed and steadied. Half an hour later, our patient woke woozily from his delirium and began calling out for water. His voice was weak, but without distress. If he is strong, his body should fight off the disease in a few days. Gillies said. 
Returning to his bag, he brought out a brown paper packet and sprinkled what looked like dried herbs into the pot on the stove. The tea will control the fever. It must be drunk three times a day. Gillies held up three fingers to his patient. Tres veces al día. Mañana, mediodía y noche. The man nodded weakly. He shifted his head so as to glance about the room, his eyes searching for his daughter. Luisa? We all turned to the darkened corner where the girl was squatting, with her hands wrapped around her knees. Papa? She seemed uneasy about going to him. Leg went to fetch her. Crouching on his haunches, he swept the tangle of black hair from her face and looked into her eyes. Only then did she manage a smile. Todo lo que él necesita es tu amor, the young lieutenant said. All he needs is your love. It was a relief to be back outside in the sunshine. Straightening my back, I took several deep breaths to clear the rancid air from my lungs. Gillies leant against the wall of the house and gazed blankly across the lane. You saved a man's life in there, I said. He glanced at me and shrugged. Let us hope so. I have never seen such a dramatic recovery, I went on, meaning it quite sincerely. The man was at death's door. It was incredible to watch. We were lucky this time, he said, managing a smile, and I noticed a look of sadness in his eyes. I then recalled the piece of unkind gossip Woolerton had related about Gillies, how a young officer had died while under his care, and how the incident had led to his dismissal. Bernie seemed to think the young man died of yellow fever. Perhaps the situation had been not unlike today, except that Gillies had been unable to save his patient back then. Death's door, Gillies said. Have you ever thought what it might look like? Not really, I confessed. Do you think it has a handle? He mused. I suppose it does, but we're mostly afraid to look at it, aren't we? Let alone reach out and grab it with our hand. He wrapped his cane against the wall. At any rate, all credit goes to Mr. Burney for our patient's return to life. We had several long discussions about tropical fevers on the passage from England. It was Burney who told me about the Chao Longo. I was merely putting his theory of bloodletting into practice. Leg emerged from the dwelling, having said his goodbyes to the little girl. Setting off back through the quebradas, we walked at a leisurely pace through the poorer quarter of town, passing the saddlers, tailors, and blacksmiths who supplied the markets and the wealthy merchants in the port. Many were closed for the festival. Nearing the marketplace, we became caught up in the steady flow of people pouring into the central plaza. The bullfight was over, and the festivities continued with flamboyant matadors swooping and swaggering through the crowds, yelling out, Toro, Toro, as children charged through their scarlet capes. As Leg was keen to buy a few provisions for our patient and his daughter, I said I would accompany Gillies on the walk back to the Almendral. We could meet here later, the lieutenant suggested. I imagine the festivities will carry on well into the night. Yes, well, perhaps, I smiled at him. But you carry on, enjoy yourself, get drunk or something. Aye, aye, Captain. Leg tipped his straw hat, retreating backwards into the crowd. I will keep a lookout for you. I took Gillies along the promenade so as to avoid the crowds in the centre of the town. It was high tide, and the sea had all but engulfed the beach. There were several ships in the harbour, their flags flapping in the afternoon breeze. Gillies leant on his cane and stared out to sea. I am intrigued about those herbs you administered. I said. What were they? Gillies shrugged. A little of this, a little of that. Foxglove for the pulse, hyssop for the lungs, a touch of St. John's wort to lift his spirits. He winked at me, then signalled with his cane that we should continue walking. Eye of newt and toe of frog. We climbed the cobbled streets to find the Almendral Plaza busy with merrymakers. Arriving at Gillies's lodgings, I looked around for the straw hat I dropped earlier, but there was no sign of it. Damn this rusty old thing, Gillies said, rattling his key inside the lock. 
There is a knack, you know. One has to... He kicked the door several times. Finally, it swung open. Gillies wobbled on his cane, then reached my arm in order to regain his balance. You must take some rest, I advised him. It has been a strenuous day, and... And it is time for some tea, he said, letting go of my arm and stepping across the threshold. He beckoned me with his hand. Don't worry, I will not keep you captive for long. There is something I have been wanting to show you. And I suppose now is as good a time as any. The Divine Sage is available free on this site for a limited period, with new episodes added each week. If you're enjoying the story and don't want to wait, check out thedivinesage.net for details of where to purchase the full audiobook.